Brent Teller film. Stones in the north resisted with all their might to prevent the dead from entering their bowels. The stones promised to forget nothing, promised to wait and keep it secret. Severe winters, hot summers, and brutal rains took the dead men from the stone. The earth opened up, revealing its underground stores. Because not only gold, not only tin, not only wolfram, not only uranium are in the Kolyma underground stores, but also human bodies, untouched by decay. The History of a Trust. First film. Everything had started very simply. To recollect our history, the 30s were proclaimed by the party to be the years of industrialization. The land of the Soviets was in great need of gold to purchase new technology abroad, and there was gold in the Kolyma. So in 1931, the decision was taken to organize a trust in the Kolyma for the opening up of the deposits of this region. In all further documents, the trust was modestly named Dostroy, Far East Construction. Edward Petrovich Berzin was nominated as its director. On the 4th of February, 1932, all the administration of the Dolstroy and the first volunteers who responded to the call of the motherland to conquer severe and impregnable Kolomar arrived in the Bay of Nagaeva. I was really imbued with Jack London stories, and in those brutal times, in 31, when neither in the provinces nor in city was there any place for romantics or beauty? 
You couldn't come to terms with yourself. It was quite natural that I longed for some far off and more interesting places. So it happened, I managed to get to Koloma. I was 20 at the time. So we arrived at the bay and approached the famous moorage of Nagaeva. We had been rowing for almost an hour and a half, dressed in light overcoats. I darted out, ran through the frontier post by the sentry, right to the kitchen and the stove, and it was the first thing I saw. Trenin left Nakhailovich. Born in 1911, lives in Columbus since 1932. Topographer, civilian. Well, there had already been a prisoner's camp there, but we did not notice it. It was no great honor to break ground for the first streets of Makadan. As a matter of fact, only one street was built, about 300 meters long along the Magadanka River. And there was the house of the 12 apostles, made of concrete. But we couldn't count on getting there. Long before the arrival of the commanding administrators of the Dostroy, Berzin dispatched more than 200,000 of its prisoners to Magadan, only a quarter of which survived. It was they who began to build the town of Magadan and the first Kalima camps. The women's camp was situated where the garment factory now sits. The men's camp was there behind the motor depot, one small part of the camp. And here was the big camp. The transit camp was at the second kilometer. Well, this whole square in front of the city executive committee was in the camp area. That's how it was at the time. And this was the very first moorage. Afterwards, in 34, just there, they began to move the seaport away from the hill. We were put ashore here, at this moorage, and there was taiga all around. There was nothing, nothing. We made the first cuttings in the forest. There were tents and small houses, just a few houses, mostly the tents. That winter when we arrived, they assigned us 14 to 16 prisoners to make ice holes. Once, it was in the morning, I came outside to rub myself with snow and suddenly saw a horse running across the sea with a sledge carrying two people. Berzin. So Eduard Petrovich takes his sheepskin coat off and comes up the stepladder to meet us. Who are you? We cry all together. Topographers. Topographers. What are you doing here? Measuring the bottom. Ah, the moorage. Oh, it's very important. Okay. So he entered, sat down for a minute with us and asked, well, when will you finish? We asked, it looks bad, Edward Pedrovich. You see, the prisoners are very weak. Well, they are gouging, hollowing. We, we do not know whether to treat them on the spot or drag them back half dead. What is necessary? Well, we say food is necessary. He immediately tears off a sheet from his notebook and writes an order to serve out 20 polar rations. Eduard Petrovich Berzin, a let from a peasant's family, wanted to become an architect. 
He graduated from Berlin Royal School of Painting, but was called up for military service. He was decorated with the St. George Cross for personal courage at the front of the World War I. He was heavily wounded. After October 1917, the Ensign Brzezin became a commander of the Latvian Rifle Men's Division, joined the party and fought actively for the victory of the Soviets. Since 1929, a professional cadre officer of the state security, he supervised the construction of the industrial complex by the Vysheta River, and the builders were prisoners too. He had a smile that was so kind. And when he met us, he said, It will be difficult, comrades. There is no road. You'll have to cover 500 kilometers on foot. Well, we accepted it as a matter of fact. 500 kilometers? Why 500? To the first ore separating mill there was to be built in the Srednikan region. We were trudging there for 22 days. And the builders, who were they? The first transports of prisoners were those convicted according to Article 7832. That was of August 7th, 1932. It was a time of starvation when people took grains left in the fields after harvesting or cabbages at night. All the same, they were convicted by the Troika, court of three judges, with no defense, and as a rule, their fate was ten years sentence and no discussion allowed. Ukin Ivan Ivanovich, born 1906, lives in Kulama since 1933, engineer, civilian, and honorable citizen of Magadan. In his time, the prisoners in general were not confined to the camps. The entire coast of the Sea of Okhotsk was colonized by this group of workers. He let them build the houses and allowed their families to come here. They were working as civilians, but afterwards Pavlov, the next director of the Dolstroy, put an end to all that. Born 1884, the first director of the Dolstroy, 1931 to 1937, shot in 1938. There were many stories told about him, both good and bad. For instance, there was this notorious dipper from the drag that had sunk, and we had to build a framework to go into the icy water and get it. People were dying like flies, but it was unthinkable to leave the dipper there. Well, they reported to Berzin in Magadan. People are dying. What's to be done? He reasoned this way. What's the cost of the dipper? 15,000 gold rubles. What's the cost of a prisoner? Two and a half paper rubles a day. Then what are you questioning me about? I was so young and foolish. I thought if they were prisoners, it meant they were criminals and deserved all that, you see. It was my understanding then. All of us enthusiasts shared that view. It was not only Jack London's impact that had driven us here. We understood that history was in the making, and we were creating it. If we toiled along rivers and streams, if we broke the roads to mines, we understood that we were pioneers. But here we saw Contras and criminals who were, we were told, sentenced to capital punishment, and then had it changed to 10 years. Well, you understand our attitude. I was not a party member, but nevertheless, I was a true child of my time. I was permeated with its spirit. Death was an everyday occurrence. Nobody asked why it came or what for, but there were secret, fervent longings, some last obstinacy, 
to die in a hospital, in bed, among people who would notice, but not in the street, not when it's intensely cold, not under guards' boots, not in a barrack among swearing, dirt, and absolute indifference. Shalama Varlam Tihanovich, 1907-1982, prisoner of Kolomak camp since 1937, sentenced under Article 58, writer rehabilitated. The central Kawama route stretches and meanders for 2,000 kilometers. All the route was built with hacks and spades, wheelbarrows and augers. Everybody here used to repeat Nekrasov's poem, The Iron Road. We overstrained ourselves, heat or cold. Backs always bent down, lived in mud huts, struggled with hunger, cold and wet, and suffered from scurvy. Well, don't be afraid for the motherland, buddy. The Russian people have endured enough. They will endure this iron road, as well as anything else our Lord would send. The Dostoroy had quickly grown up with new mines and camps, already occupying some regions of the Otosko Ivensky district that still had an administration of its own. Being not only the director of the trust, but also an official representative of the party, the Soviets, and the political police, Berson didn't wish to share any of his authority over the Kolomá with anyone. My parents were political exiles since the Tsar times. My father opened the first school here in 1913. He was a member of a political underground. My mother was exiled here in 1910 for the same reason. And this is our house. It was built for my father by the natives, Kamchadals, Ivinks, and Yakuts. They were grateful to him for all he had done for them, making them civilized people. Zoya Ignatyevna Shizova, Varen, was born in Kolomá in 1920, a member of a persecuted family and a teacher. He was a Kamshadal. His mother was an Evink, his grandfather was an American Indian, and there became Varen. Where we had come from, I don't know. So my father organized an underground revolutionary group in Kamchatka. But then somebody betrayed this group. They were exiled to different places, and my mother was exiled here. My father agitated for the Soviets. He used to say that we would live a much better life and would have everything. Then everybody voted for the Soviets. And there everything began. After the gold had been discovered, they needed cheap labor. Then the prisoners appeared here. And then somebody had slandered him, and he was arrested. When he was being taken away, he said, You must know, I am not guilty of anything. There was a camp nearby, but he was not placed here. He was transported to some other camp. 
he remained in my memory. The local camp was there, and every day people were marching out of there, accompanied by the guards' convoy and the dogs. The space was packed with people. Every day there was an endless flow of prisoners. To my mind, the street should have been named the Street of Sorrow. Merzin, the director of the Dostroy, was awarded with the highest decoration, the Order of Lenin, for the eightfold increase of gold output. The teleprogram from the government was sent to the trust. We congratulate all the workers and employees with the successes achieved in building of socialism on the Kolema. Our regards, Stalin, Malatov, Yishov. With the victory bugle sounding loudly, the program of gold output was highly increased. Berzin's request concerning the supplementary deliveries of manpower was also complied with. Mikhail Yevseyevich, born in 1915, Coloma Camp's prisoner from 1937, sentenced on the 58th clause, rehabilitated. I was one of those fanatics who believed, like in God, in the ideals connected with communism and Yosef Vissarionovich Stalin, the so-called leader of peoples. And everything they were telling me, everything I was listening to or was reading seemed to me then deeply convincing, the sacred truth. I had no right to doubt like religion, you must believe, but not... God forbid, have doubts. In summer 35, when I was a student of the Electrotechnical Institute of Communication, I was sent with a group to the so-called communist building site, Moscow Volga Canal. I had to carry on pro-party propaganda there among the men of the convoy, the guards, as a matter of fact. And then I saw this work with wheelbarrows and those exhausted people, almost confined to wheelbarrows. And I said to the officers who accompany me, what is going on? Why, it seems even the slaves were treated better in the Roman Empire. They are people. More so, I had read a book about the Bellomore Canal building. And everything there was so bright and wonderful. Everybody was re-educated. And somebody wrote a denunciation. Comrade Vygin praised a white guard colonel in the film Chapayev and condemned the actions of NKVD leaders at the building of Moscow Volga Canal. That's all. I was sent to Butyrskaya prison. There were already real interrogations. So they knock you down from a stool and then beat you with their feet and fists, swearing the entire time. 
I was carried out of there all in blood. But the most horrible torture was to stand in the attention position, not daring to sit or stir. In short, they did not succeed. I signed nothing, not a single report, not a single document. But the NKVD performed their righteous justice, sentenced to five years imprisonment for anti-Soviet agitation, and the press was already going crazy, Trotsky's organizations, wreckers. Everybody was being indignant, meetings and manifestations were going on, a struggle campaign. Boris Nikolaevich, born in 1917, prisoner of the Kolomak camp since 1938, sentenced on the 58th clause, rehabilitated. I was a Voroshilovsky rifle, as you see in this photo. This was the year we came back from Manchuria. Father worked at the northern Caucasian frontier at USSR Customs. Mother was a dentist. I was a student at the Moscow Medical Institute. And there was my sister, 13 years old. This was our family. On the 5th of November, 1937, at 5 o'clock in the morning, they knocked and showed me an order for search and arrest. And I was driven away by the automobile like a respectable man. And on the 25th of November, they arrested my mother. Well, there it is. My father and sister remained. Well, father was not arrested, but he was repeatedly summoned to their office. And every time, as my sister now tells it, he came back as if beside himself. And once, after one such visit, he committed suicide. My sister was alone, a 13-year-old girl. I was accused of participation in a student's anti-Soviet terrorist organization. And so I was beaten. There was one investigator, Radchenka. He used to aim with his boot at my belly and below. But nevertheless, I signed nothing, either about myself or about anyone else. And I consider it to be one of the greatest joys of my life. The investigation at Lubyanka continued for a month. Then I was transferred to the Butyrskaya prison and stayed there till I was sentenced and sent to the camp at Kaluma. Georgi Stepanovich, born in 1915, prisoner of the Kolomak camps from 1939, sentenced on Clause 58, rehabilitated. Petersburg is my motherland. All of us Zhonovs were born here. And so Vasilyevsky Island is a patch of land so close to my soul that sometimes I think that we've been tied together with an umbilical cord for the whole of my life. And this is the house where many of the Germans who had been invited to Russia in Peter the Great's times used to live. Those connected with art, Kirk, the German Protestant of St. Peter and St. Paul, one with a key, another with a book. Our flat was here. Boris was two years older than me. I was born in 1915, he in 1913, my older brother. 
A very talented man. He entered the university, the faculty of physics and mathematics. Unfortunately, his fate was tragic. Boris suffered for no reason at all. When Kirov was murdered and the whole university went to the pardon ceremony, as I remember, the coffin was placed in the Tavrychsky Palace. Boris said to the Komsomol organizer of his course, Look, my boots are torn, so if I go, my feet will be frostbitten. There was a very hard frost then. Evidently, the Komsomol organizer reported that. In 1936, Boris was summoned to the big house, and that was all. He never returned. He got seven years plus three years of exile, but didn't serve his time. He perished in the Vorkuta land. He understood everything and would write on tissue paper, kind of an educational course for those who would follow. Mother gave it to me to read. It all seemed so horrible to me. I was just a kid then. I burnt it. My mother only said, you shouldn't, son. It might be useful in life. Those are my memories of Boris. It's a great joy to live in our Soviet nation. After Boris's arrest, all the family was banished to Kazakhstan. Father, mother, my elder sister Nadia, little Vera. There was an order for my arrest also, but I was in the cast of M. Garesimov's film, Komsomolsk. So the NKVD kind of permitted me to finish my part. When I returned home, there was already an NKVD officer and soldier waiting for me. The arrest, that was the most terrifying moment of my life. I was so shocked when they began the search that I fainted. They took away many people from our building. I never thought it would concern me. But I did my part in the film and was arrested. The American spy. It wasn't that difficult to imagine. I had to be arrested, and so I was. The magic house in Spalernaya is full of people. You enter it a child and leave an old cripple. These words I wrote in the prison. There you have it. I was writing in the Kresti prison, even in a punishment cell. Scratch the verses on the wall. The hour will come when I leave this wet cell, and the circus will open all its doors for me. And I'll go back to the world where I was a free citizen, where I was full of hope, where I dreamed, worked, loved, to the world of sparkling, youthful days, where I gave a vow to glorify the sun, 
to the world where belief in justice had been a motto for many years. I spent more than a year in Christi, almost two years in three Leningrad prisons, Spalerka, Christi, and in deportation camp. When we were transferred to Vladivostok, it was a very long way. I wrote this poem. The wheels are chasing my thoughts to the beat, chase to the east, chase to the east. And into this small handkerchief, I cannot sob out my five-year grief. People were transported secretly. I remember it was raining, dirt all around. They forced us onto our knees, and we had to wait to board the train. We were waiting for four hours. There were many intellectuals, scientists. Then stand up, surrounded by the convoy and dogs, we were taken aboard the train. When it started moving, there appeared from somewhere, though we had been thoroughly searched, sheets of paper, pencil stubs. And we began writing letters. So I wrote to my sister, I'm a prisoner, but I am innocent. Don't believe anything. All of it is a lie, slander. And imagine, she got that message. It's a pity we lost that note, but you see, nothing's coherent. She got that note. Trains were moving in an endless stream like in war times. Before the dawn, we stopped somewhere in Krasnoyarsk. There would be a bath. When we came out of the railway station, there were people standing along both sides of the streets. They were throwing loaves of bread and cigarettes into our crowd. Everything they had. The convoy shouted and yelled. But it was useless. I'll never forget this trip to the Kolyma, to the Nagaevo Bay, on board the ship Jorma. Several thousand people were fed salted herring, and there was no water at that time. The loading went on for more than 12 hours, and then the ship pushed off. They simply forgot to give us water, and then the riot started. It's so terrible when the people go mad. Well, no control was possible. And there was an order to get barrels down into the hold, to take the barrels and pump fresh water in through those. But there were many common criminals among us, and they cut the hoses with knives and razors. They pressed their lips to the cut, and the water poured down their clothes, while others pressed against them like leeches. There was a terrible commotion, and they couldn't distribute the water. When the captain ordered the water pumped right into the hold, we were flooded up to our ankles. Everybody had enough water, and the result was dysentery. 700 to 800 prisoners remained forever in the Sea of Akhotsk. Half the transferees. Japan, 
шли по тропе на борт В холодные мрачные трюмы На море спускался туман Ревел стихия морская Лежит впереди Магадан Столица Колымского края I remember the van in port, the soaked and decomposing boat. There we climbed upon the gangway and shoved into the freezing hold. Curse upon you, Coloma, one of the wonders of the world. One way or another a man goes mad, and then there's no return. <laughs> Срывались глухие проклятия, Будь проклята ты, колыба, Что названа чудной планетой, Сойдешь по неволе с ума, Оттуда возврата уже нет. Перезли меня на приз к верхней Атурях. We were brought to the Verkhny Aturyak mine. It is one of the biggest mines. There were probably 7,000 people. And as soon as we disembarked, they divided us up and marched us to work. A wheelbarrow, a miner's hack and a spade. There were 12-hour shifts, sometimes 14, 16 hours. It meant that a man could hardly survive a year. Hungry. Cold, sleepless people worked for 12 hours trying to do an enormous day's work. And one's rations depended on his task. The main part wasn't victuals, but a ration of bread. There was a saying, a big ration is a killer, not a small one. That is, those who wanted to get more worked themselves to death. One of the most terrible things for political prisoners was the fact that we shared the camp with criminals, bandits, swindlers, thieves, with the dregs of society. And I think that neither hunger nor cold made us suffer more than our neighbors. All of the human feelings, love, friendship, envy, love of fellow man, mercy, thirst for glory, honesty, left us along with the flesh we lost during our continuous starvation. In the thin muscular layer which still remained on our bones and still allowed us to eat, to move, to breathe, and even to saw logs, load with spades, stones, and sand into wheelbarrows, and even to draw the wheelbarrows along endless wooden ladders in gold mines along a narrow wooden track to the washing device. There was only evil, the most lasting feeling which remained in that muscular layer. I come here every year following some urge because I was living here for a long time. There's a certain Kolama bait for us. Mirzonov Mikhail Prokofievich, born in 1912, prisoner of the Kolama camps from 1938, sentenced on the 58th clause, rehabilitated. Till 35, I worked as a chairman of the Kokov in the Chita region, not far from the Daurya River. Then 36 began, all this Stalinist turmoil, all the region, all of the Far East suffered. 
In some places, only the women remained. It was terrible, worse than war. I was sentenced to 10 years of confinement and five years of disenfranchisement. I was found guilty of belonging to the wrong class. I was sent to mines, to Verkhny, to Gorky, where people died of exhaustion from incredibly hard labor. There was great discord in the Coloma camps. The professional criminals, they would slash a man to death on the spur of the moment for no reason. To take away, food away from a hungry man was a habit to them. We had to work hard because of labor heroes. Was there such a movement in camps? Yes, they introduced it there, same as at large. In camps? In camps. Soviet propaganda of the time was used to affirm enemies of people are being re-educated by labor behind barbed wire and the walls of barracks were decorated with slogans like let's transform NKVD to Vostolog camps into a united heroic labor collective. These were the components of the reforging system for Dolstroy camps. When we were told that Berzin was an enemy of the people, we didn't believe it. He seemed to be a man who tried his best to build as much and as soon as possible. It was difficult to believe that he was the enemy. Berzin was a very ordinary chief of the camp, a diligent subordinate who executed the will of those above him. The annihilation of party men on the part of other party men was one of the main principles of murder for the Stalinist times, and they in their turn were annihilated by the new third wave of murderers. Berzin was arrested in 1937, and he perished, having committed murders himself for Stalin. The local newspaper, Pravda, called Berzin the best man in state security and a firm Bolshevik whose name had already been attached to a street, a mine, a cooperative, and a ship, who wore the highest decoration in the country, was accused of creating an insurgent anti-Soviet Koloma organization and was shot in 1938. Berzin's wife was sentenced to nine years and served her time. There was a horrible wave of arrests. All of us were frightened. Everybody kept a suitcase with underwear and bread crusts ready. Every night we were listening for knocking at doors. We lived in barracks. There were many rooms. And when you heard knocking at the door, it meant somebody was being taken. Berichenko disappeared in the morning. Then Sokolov. Every night started like that. There was real horror. It overwhelmed everyone. I remember being in a classroom, and the teacher entered and said, Zoya, don't you worry, nothing terrible happened, but still be ready for trouble. Follow me. We went out. There were about 40 children in the street. 
Some had small bundles with them, and everyone was sitting on the ground, and as soon as they saw me, they began crying and rushed to me. My father was arrested again, and so we marched on, me in front, and behind me a column of the arrested children, excuse me, children of the arrested, and we saw the dogs and the guards approaching us, and I can't say this. Wait. Wait a minute. And in the middle, our mothers, all dressed in quilted jackets and heavy boots. They were coming towards us. And neither convoy nor dogs could hold us. We rushed to each other. It's impossible either to forget or to speak about what followed. The worst part began when Pavlov was appointed the chief of the Dolstroy, and Colonel Garenin became his right hand. That was the end of orchestras, speeches, rostrums, and tribunes. The guards marched us to and from work, and our conditions became much harder. The professional criminals were made our commanders. Before the day began, the commanding trustees used to read out. According to the decision of Troika, the court of three, for sabotage and economical counter-revolution, the following prisoners are sentenced to be shot. The sentence was executed, and every day some 70 to 80 men were sentenced. Well, once all of us were gathered together, dressed in whatever we had on, and the guards surrounded us. They marched us out not far from Katinak settlement. We heard the command, halt. We entered the camp and stood behind the gates. And then, while we were waiting behind the gates, I saw a wooden house, and to the left, in the distance, a funnel and a puff of smoke above it. A tractor was working somewhere nearby. We were taken to the barrack. The door was open. There was a terrible stench. I found myself standing close to a nearby stool. We were all standing so close that if a man died, he remained standing. There was no place to fall down. Approximately five days later, there was a command to go out. You're accused of gathering gold at the partisan mine in order to transfer it by plane to Mexico for Trotsky. I told them, until now I have admitted to none of your accusations, but this one is so ridiculous that I'll think about it. I saw Colonel Garni. He opened the door, short and massive, and stated, Mind you, the Coloma is the last place on the continent, and the Serpentinka camp is the last place on the Coloma. 
You will sit here and stink, but you won't stink here for long. I'll cut all your heads off. Soon they started to take groups of people out of the Serpentinka camp. Some 40 prisoners were taken to the gates with their belongings. And we already guessed that everyone who was called out was going to his grave. All of them were shot. There was no way out. The moment came when I was called out. Gather all your things and go out, you and you, Vagon included. Well, you see, I didn't respond. There's nobody named Vagon here. My name is Vigan. I didn't respond. Why, the usual thing. He might have already kicked the bucket somewhere. Well, it was mass extermination of people. The Treblinka of Koloma. When they fulfilled the plan, there were 13 of us. I couldn't walk on my own. They brought a cart and drove us off to the clinic. Still, I got an additional sentence for the economic sabotage manifested in breaking a wheelbarrow. Ten years. They made it seem as if people were simply going away. There would be the loud noise of tractor engines. But nobody ever returned. Stalin was asked to send more people to the camps to dig for gold. He said, but you had people. Where are they? Why, there are no people. They died. Well, work with those you still have. The main conclusion was that people ate themselves up. I am sure that people devoured themselves. There was incredible slander. I experienced that myself. Once I was sitting at the investigator's office and saw two men coming in, whom I worked with at the mine. I was asked, do you know them? I said, yes, I do. And they told that I had said before the war that Turkey, Japan, Germany would conquer the Soviet Union and liberate us. So I got the 58th article. Right in the camp? Right in the camp, in addition to what I already had.
I know nothing about what happened to my father. There came the decision to set my mother free. They demanded a confirmation from her that her husband was a Japanese spy. In a solitary cell in the corner near the ceiling, they hung a tin pail with a very small hole. They filled it with water, tied her hands, and she had to stand in the corner with drops of water falling on her head. Well, he was torn away from us very early on and taken to the house for prisoners' children. They gathered all the prisoners' kids there. And my mother was at that Southern Mining Administration. But I knew nothing about it. The camp's theater traveled from mine to mine, and I played Arbuzov's Tanya. So a guard comes up to me and says, Zoya, your mother is here. And I think, dear me, how shall I play now? And I stepped onto the stage. I was saying my part in meanwhile, looking for her in the hall. I could not find her. Every one of them wore gray jackets and had such gray faces, downcast and suffering. I could not find her. And then we were herded to a bus. Oh, it's hard for me. Excuse me, I can't. Everybody was seated and the bus started. Everybody was silent, dead silent. Suddenly somebody said, well, what the hell? Let's sing a song. And so these children with tears in their eyes began singing, sobbing. Why didn't my motherland? In my country, there are many forests, fields and rivers. I've never seen a country like this where people can breathe so freely. And our class teacher began crying loudly Stop it, stop it, and cried openly. They were neither the enemies of the power nor state criminals. Dying, they still could not understand why they had to die. All disconnected, terribly lonely, they were dying of hunger, cold, labor, beating, and illness in the white desert of Kalima. And ship after ship, loaded with new prisoners, were arriving to replace them. Screenwriter, Kirill Nikolaev. Director, Mikhail Mikheyev. Cameraman, Andrei Andreev. Sound, Natalia Solomonik. Composer, Dmitry Pavlov. English text by Antitoli Anlehin. Translation by Gwendolyn Womack. Voiceover by Daniel Kleinfeld. Liz Hilliard, Sven Holmberg, and Brett Levy.